Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry. We are in the middle of a very busy season of triathlons, ultra swims and 10Ks. Of course, marathons and half marathons are in full swing across the country, with the Dublin Marathon fast approaching in October. For serious athletes, it's all about being in it to win it. But for the majority of us, myself included, these events are just massive challenges and personal challenges. So making sure we are fit and ready to get to the finish line is super, super important. But what does that mean for our training plans? Should we do things differently the days before and the morning of our race? This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Emma Dunleavy, coach at perfectpacing.com, to chat all about the different things you should consider for any kind of event that you're taking part in. Emmett, welcome to the show. How's it going? Thanks, Cara. Thanks for having me. So, distance events have become popular and more popular probably than ever before, even 10Ks, half marathons and longer. Mm. People have really got into the groove of events and training for things. They have, and I suppose the Dublin Marathon is a reflecting, a wider reflection of that. You go back 15 years ago, the Dublin Marathon was a much, much smaller event. Now it sells out within a couple of days uh, of, of going on sale and, and getting a ticket can be harder than actually getting into, the, getting into the finish line of the event itself. So it's a great reflection of the interest in endurance events, um, you know, right across triathlon, swimming and everything, like you just pointed out. Um, and it's great. It's great to have people involved. And if you're even contemplating a marathon, it's a great place to be because it shows you're living a healthy and active lifestyle. But those, I suppose, training to, to do really well, they tend to know what they're at. They, well, sometimes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if not slightly obsessive, uh, but they, it's the beginners and people starting out that I think even listening into today's episode, they're, they're the ones that we need to tell a little bit more about what to do, how to do it. Mm. And of course, it all starts with some form of a training plan for an endurance event. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, a lot of the principles that would apply to the faster guys will apply to, you know, people who are just trying to get around the event as well. I think when you look at a marathon, probably the the biggest factor in getting yourself from where we are now, three or four months out to the starting line is managing the training load, that you're not spiking the training load too quickly along the way, because ultimately what gets you in the best shape for a marathon is consistent training over that three or four months. You don't want that interrupted by injury. And in order to prevent injury, you need a training plan that's well laid out, that progresses in a very gradual manner, is periodized um, and allows you to get to the starting line in the best shape possible. And then very often, if you've got the three or four months beforehand correct, then a lot of it on race day actually looks after itself. And let's stick with the marathon for a sec. So how much of a baseline do you think people need before attempting a marathon or thinking about doing a marathon? So I guess for a lot of people, if they're new to the sport, there tends to be this graduation up through the distances. They do a couch to 5K or they do a 10K. Yeah. And all of a sudden their eye is drawn to run in a half marathon and they're up at the marathon very quickly. I think and of course I, the race series, that's what, because we mm. when I was in my early 20s and I started running, that was exactly what I did. Yeah. So I did a 5K, then I did the race series in the park. That's before, right. Before, yeah. And Fingal 10K was just all the way up. Yeah. And it was fantastic. It's great. Um, but I guess if you're, if you're relatively new to the sport, don't be in too much of a hurry to move up to the distances. If you're doing some 5Ks and 10Ks and you're still improving over those distances, try and, and squeeze out as much progress as you can over the shorter distance before feeling like you have to move to a half marathon or have to move to a marathon. But if you've done a couple of years of running and you are you feel like you've, you've got enough experience under your belt at the shorter stuff, um, then moving to the marathon is a good idea. And then it's giving yourself a sort of a nice window of three to four months to prepare for that. And I guess we have um, a lot of our marathon runners are beginning their program at the minute. So they start 17 weeks out. And what we recommend is that before they get to that, the start of that 17 weeks, that they're comfortably running th a minimum of three or four times per week. Yeah. And that they can at least run 80 to 90 minutes for their long run at the weekend. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. So it's quite manageable. And if you're running 5Ks and 10Ks, that should be a sort of a minimum benchmark before you begin your training plan. Uh, and then if you're able to do tho those, then you, you gradually obviously increase the mileage as the weeks go through, um, as you go through the marathon itself. And in terms of injury prevention, should people go and see like a physio and get a once over before they start into like a, a training plan for a bigger event in case they're worried about injuries or, or anything like that, or just jump into the training plan? And manage it. For most people, they'll probably just jump in. I guess with injuries, some people are more naturally more robust than others. Some people will never uh, find themselves on a physio table. They'll never go to the gym to do any strength and conditioning. And they're just born, they're, they're born robust and, and good luck to them. They're yep, very lucky. I'm very jealous of them. But for the majority <laughs> of us, I think, um, you know, in terms of injury prevention, having a good physio that understands what you're doing is really useful. It's somebody that you can get access to at, a short, in, in, at short notice because when you're marathon training and if injury does crop up, you want to get it seen to as, mm -hmm. straight, as, straight, uh, as quickly as possible. The other two things to keep in mind when it comes to injury is if you do end up missing a week or two of training for whatever reason, 
is try and cross train to prevent that detraining effect because very often people will get injured and they'll just sit on their hands for two weeks for the whatever the calf strain or whatever it is to heal make sure you're doing something to, to prevent that detraining effect so you don't lose all of that aerobic fitness that you've built up and then I suppose the third aspect of it is in addition to a good training plan what you want to do is add in some resistance training or some strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily making you faster for the marathon. Okay, it's not like a 5K athlete who will get a little bit of a benefit from that power work. For marathon runners, you're trying to make them more robust, that they can handle the mileage. So strength and conditioning work helps kind of put that little base in place, makes you a little bit stronger and means that as the mileage creeps up, you're less likely to pick up injuries and niggles along the way. And it's probably the one piece of training people don't do enough of when they're training for an endurance event they don't hit the gym both in terms of strength work but flexibility work too which is really important yeah and most endurance athletes they like getting out there they like getting out on their bike they like getting out and doing the miles they absolutely detest going into a gym to lift weights that tends to be from my experience the people that you deal with um they don't enjoy the, the strength and conditioning work. Mm -hmm. But it is a necessary evil for a lot of people. And ultimately, like I said, you want to get to the starting line thinking, right, I've left, uh, you know, I've, I've done everything I have to get to the starting line in the best shape possible. And doing some strength and conditioning once or twice a week can be can be part of that. And it's, it's a necessary evil for a lot of endurance athletes along the way. And let's chat through some basic resistance work that people should be doing, whether they're in a gym or not in a gym. What kind of work mm. should they be doing as part of their training plan? So if you haven't done much strength and conditioning previously, I suppose starting off with general body weight stuff, mm -hmm. lunges, squats, um, using some resistance bands, all of that and doing sort of high reps, but very low weight or just body weight. Really good. Um, the other thing that's useful to add in is some small plyometrics. And so what I mean by that is like hops and skips. Um, bounding work. Bounding yeah. work, exactly. Yeah. And a lot of that is very useful um, for conditioning the body just as a sort of a, a, an, an initial base. If you're a bit more experienced, you've done some of that before, I suppose where you would like to graduate to is your strength and conditioning work will become more about uh, developing power. So you develop all your endurance out on the road when you're doing your miles. And then if you, if you have, like I said, it's important to note that this is, if you're a little bit more experienced with strength mm -hmm. and conditioning, is that you're lifting heavier weights, shorter number of reps, and you're developing power uh, as opposed to that sort of base strength. But if you're going down that road of, uh, lifting heavier weights, you need help with Supervision, it. Supervision, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to be moving correctly. You need somebody to keep an eye on what you're doing. Uh, maybe not every day, but certainly maybe once a month, somebody to have a look at what you're doing. So if you're going down that road of, of uh, lifting heavier weights, if you're a bit more experienced, get some help with it. Get somebody to program it for me. Okay, so it's part of your training plan for any endurance event, at least one day a week should be gym work in some way, shape or form. I would say at least one day. Least and if you're, if you're serious about what you're doing, and, and, and particularly if you're a little bit more injury prone, twice a week. Okay. Uh, age and injury. So presumably as you get older, you have a higher risk factor of picking up niggles along the, or do you? You do, yeah. Unfortunately, as we get older, obviously muscle mass drops off a little bit. We don't recover as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously injury becomes a bigger factor. So there's two things you need to do there. It's probably make that strength and conditioning um, more of a cornerstone of yep. what you do on a weekly basis, but also allowing more recovery in between the harder sessions. Um, particularly if you're doing sort of harder interval work or threshold stuff during the that week. Everyone hates. So the speed work, yes, basically. Yes, exactly. The yeah, high intensity yeah. stuff. You, it, I would say once you kind of tip over that sort of 40, 45 uh, years of age, that's when those type of sessions tend to take more of a toll and you need to leave bigger gaps in between it. Uh, one of the, I suppose, a common mistake I would see with athletes is they try to do too many hard interval days yeah. during the week. Don't allow enough recovery. And while there's a, a short term bit fitness benefit to that, longer term, it, it means that there's more likely to end up in injuries and inconsistencies and, and ultimately that will stifle your progress along the way. So leave plenty of recovery in between the hard days. And different runs or, you know, if it's a marathon training plan or even a 10K or whatever, each run has a different pace. Mm -hmm. So a long run is a slightly slower run. You have your interval run and it's important to, to recognize the difference between the type of runs that you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. So... For most people, if you're training four or five times per week, you're looking, obviously, the, the backbone of your week is your long run at the weekend. Mm -hmm. For the majority of people, that's long and easy. It should be done at a pace where you're able to have a conversation. You can look at heart rates and thresholds and stuff like that, but if you want to break it down to basics, you should be able to comfortably have a conversation for pretty much the whole duration of that long run at the weekend. Of your other three to four runs during the week, one of them should be high intensity, so some sort of a tempo run, some threshold stuff, whatever it might be, that's specific to where you're at at the moment, right? So it's not necessarily going out and smashing that run as hard as you can. Finish those workouts feeling like if I had to do 10 or 15 percent more, I'd be able to do it. So that's two days accounted for. Your other days are just short, easy runs. Again, conversational pace um, and done at an intensity where you're you're not straining yourself too too much. They're not necessarily easy. You're still tired after them, but the intensity is not high. OK, 
and that applies for si- vaguely for cycling, for swimming, and even my own. Like the last couple of months, of swimming has been my own core training. Mm-hmm. And like that, I've had long, easy swims, short two k races where you're flat out and you're hard and you're sore yeah. afterwards. Interval work. So, you know, it applies across a very broad spectrum of sports. Absolutely, it's the same principles apply for all, everything: cycling, swimming, triathlon. Um, a good rule of thumb with these is that you're looking for around about eighty percent of your weekly training is low intensity. Um, it, it's, it's at what we would call below the aerobic threshold. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no accumulation of lactate. Your heart rate doesn't go particularly high. And then the other sort of 20, maybe even less, maybe 15%, maybe even only, only 10% of your week is high intensity. And I think that's probably the mix that a lot of people get wrong is they feel like every day they put on their shoes, they need to go out and push. Whereas you, need to, de- yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to develop that stochastic between the hard days and the easy days. Um, and every day doesn't have to be pushing hard. Let's chat through recovery then. We mentioned it there about rest. What other tips have you got for people to recover after any of the sessions that they do? So I guess just in in terms of the layout of your week, ultimately the best training for a runner is to run. So you run as many miles as you can during the week and and you get better off that. But not everybody can handle um, a lot of running every week. So don't be afraid to add some cross training in there on recovery days. So let's say you do a hard workout on a Tuesday. Wednesday, you're feeling a little bit banged up muscles are sore, don't be afraid to use some elliptical training, maybe on the bike, do some swimming, something that gives you a little bit of an aerobic stimulus, gets the blood flowing, helps you recover from the previous day, but it's not putting more fatigue on top of what you've accumulated on Tuesday. So I'd say to people, don't be afraid to use cross training as part of your marathon training plan. Um, And then I guess the other aspect of that is nutrition. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I guess uh, when it comes to nutrition and marathon, most of us who are runners, we know what healthy eating looks like. We know what good foods and bad foods are. But probably where we fall down is in terms of fueling the key sessions and particularly the long run at the weekend. That you're fueling well beforehand, you're fueling well during the run, and then you're fueling well afterwards. And I think where most people could do with improving this is taking their, their gels or their fuel during all of their long runs in that last 12, 14, 16 weeks before the marathon. Because the more often you take the fuel, you recover better from that particular session, but you're also training your gut and then on marathon day, you're less likely to have those GI issues that very often happen. People who's, who haven't used gels before, they go to the expo on the Saturday, end yeah. up buying four or five gels. Or they, or they, or they change the, the brand of gel. Because gel, exactly. for any, if you use them, no matter what sport you're using them for, they are, they're very different. They're very different. Like the high eights, the Connecticut ones, to the power yeah. gel. Like they're, all, they're very, some are super watery, some are very gloopy, mm-hmm. some taste nice, some don't. You know, so the final one that works for you is really important. Absolutely, yeah. And that can take a little bit of experimenting mm-hmm. in training. The other thing to keep an eye out for with the different brands is they have different amount of carbohydrate in there. So you're looking for, as a general rule, you're aiming for about 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. So look at the gel and see, some of them only have 15 grams of carbohydrate, some of them have maybe 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrate. So obviously the density of the gel will dictate how many you need to take. Gear is important then. If you're going to start on any journey, whether it's no matter what the sport is, getting the right gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, running is one that we're talking about a lot. Runners, clothing, setting yourself up for success is crucial when it comes to when it comes to starting into a training plan. Yeah, absolutely, and probably the most important piece of kit is the obvious one: is your shoes. Yeah. So, if you're a little bit less experienced, get yourself to a good running store, try on a couple of different pairs of shoes, uh, and and go with the pair that's most comfortable. You get good advice in most of the good running stores in terms of what's what's suitable for you. The other thing um, that that is, I suppose, has changed the game in terms of marathon running in the last few years are the carbon plated shoes. So they're obviously these are high end shoes. If people aren't familiar with them, they've got um, carbon plates in them. They've got nice squishy foam, okay. which helps absorb the impact each time you hit the ground. You're not you're not absorbing as much of an impact, uh, and the carbon plates help propel you. So if you look at the elite level, it has probably moved elite marathon times on by about two to three minutes. Wow. Which at the very top end, and the carbon plate is in the sole. Presumably? It's in the sole, yeah, and it's surrounded by the foam. Okay. And then, yeah, it's it really changed. And I'll, well, the, the example I give there is at the at the very elite end. I mm-hmm. mean, obviously, I coach a lot of athletes in in you know middle of the pack runners as yeah. well. You've seen over the over the last three four years, their times has improved significantly as well. What it allows you to do, most of all, it, it makes you faster on race day, which is great. But it also, if you're wearing them during some of your key long runs, it allows you to recover quicker. There's not as much impact on the body. There's not as much muscle damage, and ultimately, you can get onto your next hard session that little bit quicker and, and safer. Okay, there's one thing I haven't tried. That's okay. I'm gonna try them. They yeah, seem, they seem check cool. them out. Um, Free speed. So, yeah, start with your runners and work your way up, get the right foot for the right foot type in terms yeah. of make sure they feel comfortable. Uh, and then it's getting just gear and not changing your gear t- t- oh, too close to the race day. Yeah, we would always get our marathon runners to say the, the longer runs in the final two to three weeks is 
treat those long runs as as marathon yeah, day. Yeah. Wear the gear that you're going to wear, wear the shoes you're going to wear, and very importantly, have the breakfast in uh, in the same timeline that you're likely to have it on race day. So mm-hmm. get up, and it, it, it really is a dress rehearsal for the for the marathon day itself. And if those two or three weeks go well, then you can have a lot more confidence on race day that things will be, hopefully. And towards away. race day, then, every training plan that you, people follow should have a taper Mm-hmm. in some way, shape, or form in it. So tell us about it, what a taper is and the effect of it. So the taper is effectively some at some stage inside the last two to three weeks, depending on the program you follow, just a re- gradual reduction in volume. So it's allowing your body to, what's known as super compensation, mm-hmm. absorb all of the training that you've done for the last 10 or 12 weeks, um, allow you to freshen up so that you're fresh and ready to go on the starting line. Uh, and like I said, more importantly, it's, it's absorbing all of that, those training stimuluses that you've got. I tend to work with a sort of a 10 or 12 day taper. So the final two weeks, we gradually drop things down. So for example, somebody might run for maybe two and a half to three hours, three weeks out from the marathon, but their final long run the week before might only be 80 or 90 minutes. Um, and, and then when you come into the final five to six days, those runs should be short, 30 to 40 minutes, and um, maybe add an extra rest day in there from what you would have in a normal week. And really, once you get inside the last 10 days, you're not getting any more any fitter. Yeah, there's no gains. That's there's no gains to the bench, yeah. it's, it's about being fresh and, and just uh, trusting in what you've already done, because the only thing you can do on race week is, is mess it up by doing too much. Carbo loading, close to the race day. Yeah, pretty much just the day before. So the science on this has changed quite a bit over yeah. the last few years. Old school, it was a, it was a pasta fest for the week, and now that yeah. in terms of 15, 20 years ago, when I was when I started doing marathons, where yeah. now it's kind of there's almost a reduction in carbs for the initial part of the week, and then load a day or before, a day and a half before. Yeah, like I suppose your body is so well trained from the the months of training that you've done of depleting those carbohydrate stores and replenishing them quite quickly. That's what you've trained your body to do. So you really only, in the last sort of 24, 36 hours, need to do that carb loading. So the day before the race, you know, have your pastas, your your baked potatoes, uh, all of those things. Don't overdo it. Sometimes people get too excited the day before a race and particularly the morning of a race um, and eat too much. I'd say if you've done your carb load the day before, the breakfast the morning of the race is, it's not, I won't say it's not important, but you are, your, your glycogen stores are almost They're at their, at their yeah. peak from the day before. A nice light breakfast, again, something that you've experimented with and you're good to go. Uh, but yeah, most of your, your carb loading is done naturally by your body anyway. Your favourite breakfast before a race? Something we've changed. Uh, we work with a nutritionist called Evan Lynch and Evan would have got a lot of our guys to actually switch from porridge, which is the, the, the go-to one, uh, to stuff like Cocoa Pops and Rice Krispies. Go on. Because okay. they're, it's, 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 quick, it's easily absorbed. Um, it's yeah. a nice... Uh, fast energy source and it's it's much easier on the tummy than Coca Pops. So wow. it, it went down a treat in the training group. <laughs> when Evan suggested this. Sure they all they all uh, love that. Now it's not to say that porridge is not useful, but yeah, yeah. it's just if you're going to have porridge the morning of race, earlier, make it? sure it's well back from it's the race. Two or three hours. So if you're starting your race at half eight, you probably need to be up at five thirty. Yeah, yeah. So something to keep it. And again, some people have iron stomachs. They'll have porridge yeah. an hour beforehand. They'll be fine. Yeah. But as a general rule, you're always better off going with best practice. So don't be afraid to have your cocoa pops and your rice krispies the morning. Of the listeners will be happy out. Uh, I was going to ask you about caffeine. So tea, coffees, pre-energy drinks, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so caffeine is one of the best um, natural supplements that you can take. That is, There's loads of science to suggest that it's, it's, it's performance enhancing and it's legal, obviously, which is even better. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, taking caffeine, take your caffeine beforehand. Like it, like it peaks in the blood after about maybe 30 to 45 minutes. And then it lasts for four to six hours. So for most people, if you take your coffee or your caffeine before the race, then you've got that to sustain you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a small error people would often make when it comes to taking gels is particularly taking caffeine gels is they tend to backload the caffeine gels and take them around the sort of 22 mile mark or the yep. 20 mile mark. By the time that that caffeine has hit your system, mm-hmm. you're picking up your bag in Marion Square. Yep. So front load the caffeine, have it before the race or take the caffeine gels earlier in the race. And they're kind of every 45 or so, that's what it used to be. Uh, generally speaking, like I said earlier, we're looking for around about 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Yep. So do the maths in terms of how many gels you need to take uh, and t- start taking them straight away. So I think most people should be taking your first gel after about 30, 40 minutes and then at those sort of regular intervals thereafter. Competing versus completing. Is there a huge difference in terms of the training, the planning uh, for people? Um, I think that, yeah, the probably is in terms of the faster you go, the more dialed in the specifics need to be on, particularly on the interval and threshold days. So some of our faster athletes will be looking, will be at the sharper end I mean, um, of, of the marathon in Dublin and, and, and a lot of them will go to Berlin. Wow. The specifics of their fast days are very specific. So we'll use lactates, we'll take heart rates oh, yeah, okay. and, and those mat- metrics are cha- um, yeah. tracked quite closely. For If you're competing, or completing, 
and you're trying to get around. Keep in mind, the marathon is a 99% aerobic event. The By doing some speed work, you're, you're complicating it, mm-hmm. maybe unnecessarily. So your first focus, if you're completing the marathon, is just get the mileage done. Yep. Don't worry about how fast you're going, just get the runs done. And then if you happen to be improving and, and you want to squeeze a little bit more out, be specific with your workouts and your harder intensity days, but get some help with that because it's often people just go as hard as they can or as long as they can, which yeah. is not necessarily the right thing yeah. to do when you're... We've all, it's in hands up, I made that mistake when I first We've started. all done it. <laughs> and, and, so for people listening out, if no matter what the distance is or what you're training for, if it's your first time at it, mm. go easy. Yes. And just complete it because I, I I did the opposite and just no not great. <laughs> so you know go easy for if it's a five k, if it's a ten k, if it's a swim or a bike or a run. Just for the first one you do, get it under your belt and get it done. One hundred percent. And if you finish thinking you could have gone a little harder, that's success really. Yeah, like at any level, your first marathon will never be your fastest. You will learn a huge amount from the experience, and when you put a second block of marathon training on top of the first one, you're naturally going to be quicker. So you're, you're, whether it's a 5K or a half marathon or a marathon, your subsequent races will be better. So don't put too much pressure on yourself if it's the first time out. It also makes the benchmark for the next time a little bit easier if you don't go too fast first time out. <laughs> Absolutely. If people want to find you, where can they find you? Uh, perfectpacing.com is our website, uh, and you'll find me on Instagram as well. Um, so we put up, we're running a marathon program at the moment, and we have a lot of marathon content up there. So if you're interested, get in touch. You'll find us on uh, on the website or on Instagram. Amazing. Emma, thank you so much for coming in and joining us today. Great content and great advice. And uh, we'll have lots of very happy listeners eating their Cocoa Pops over the weekend. So thank you very much. Folks, that is it for another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. As ever, we really hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate and review if you did. Uh, it's realhealth at independent.ie if you have an email for us or at Carl Henry PT on Instagram. We'll see you later for more Real Health. Slow and go full.